Okay, so we are back, and I wanted to talk about folk wisdom and common sense. Okay, so I've been talking about how important science is and how we shouldn't be using philosophy and things like that. So why do I have a slide labeled folk wisdom and common sense? Okay, now folk wisdom means you know, sort of like common sense. So these are sort of interchangeable terms. Um, and it kind of gets at that non-scientific, I think I know kind of reasoning that we oftentimes will use. So we're going to talk about this more in another chapter, but I really wanted to illustrate something um, right now that I think will help drive home how important it is to think scientifically rather than through sort of your gut or your common sense or your intuition. So I don't know if you guys ever saw the old version of Let's Make a Deal. They often times call this the Monty Hall problem because it was the structure of Let's Make a Deal. Um, but in Let's Make a Deal, which was an old game show, and they've got a new version on, but they don't play it quite like this. So in the old version, the um, contestant would be shown three doors, and they could pick one door, one door would then be opened and they'd be shown that they didn't win the prize behind that door. See, look, it's not back here. So now the question is, do you want to stay with the door that you originally picked or do you want to switch to the other unopened door? So just to reset it up for you again, I'm going to show you a little, um, well, I, I don't want to show you till we're doing a real count. So you're shown three doors. You're told one has a prize behind it. You pick one door out of the three. Now that you've made your selection, the host, in this case, Monty Hall, says, well, I can tell you it's not behind this door. And he opens it up and shows you there's a goat or whatever behind that door. So the quintessential question now is, okay, so do you want to stick with the door that you chose or do you want to switch to the other unopened door? For, sorry my mom. Um, for a lot of people, the answer is it doesn't matter. I, I might as well stick with the one that I originally picked. It has just as much likelihood of being right as the other one does. And that's what we call folk wisdom or common sense. We say to ourselves, okay, so I picked the door when there were three to choose from, so I had a 33% chance of being right. Now that you showed me that one of them doesn't contain the prize, I'm down to two doors. And I have a 50-50 chance of being right. So I might as well just stick with the one that I have. Like, why would I not? Well, statistically, that logic is faulty. Uh, it turns out that our gut, our logic, takes us down the wrong path in this particular game. So um, I'm going to – normally what I like to do in class is have everybody vote on what I should do, stay or switch, what door I should start with, whatever. Since I don't have feedback, I'm going to use the nice, reliable, scientific consistency method. And I'm going to go through um, a bunch of trials. I'm just going to go ahead and pick door number one on the first 10 trials. Uh, I'm going to pick door number one on all the trials. And then for the first 10, I'll stay every time. And for the second 10, I'll switch every time. And let's see whether it matters if I stay or switch. Okay. I'm going to pick door number one. It tells me that, okay, the door number two has, I don't know, a pig behind it. And so I'm asked, do you want to stay or switch? I'm going to stay. Oh, no, I got a pig. So I go, okay, let's do it again. Door number one, I'm going to stay. Got the pig again. Okay. Door number one, going to stay. Oh, I got the car. Door number one, I'm going to stay. Got a pig again. Door number one, going to stay. Pig. Door number one, stay, car. Door number one, stay, ooh, I got a car again. Door number one, stay, pig. Door number one, stay, pig. Door number one, stay, pig. Okay, so I did 10 trials where I stayed on all the trials, and I, got, I won 30% of the time. Now I'm going to switch my strategy. I'm going to pick door number one, but I'm always going to switch. Door number one, switch, got a pig. Door number one, switch, got a pig. Door number one, switch, got a pig. I am pig happy. Door number one, switch, car. 
Door number one, switch, car. Door number one, switch, car. Door number one, switch, car. Door number one, switch, car. Door number one, switch, car. Door number one, switch, car. Okay. So I switched 10 times. I won seven out of those 10 times. So if you're thinking skeptically, I appreciate it because that's like 99% of this class is to teach you how to think critically. So you might be thinking thoughts like, well, maybe this isn't a very random game. Um, there are a lot of factors that you might be thinking about. I would like to urge you, if you are interested in trying this yourself, you can see the URL for it. Um, there are lots of different versions of this. If you just put Monty Hall game simula simulation, there's lots of different versions of it that you can try. I really strongly recommend that you come up with a strategy like I did where you decide to stay for some number of trials and decide to switch for some number of trials rather than randomly just trying to win, um, but actually have a policy. Um, you could try it, like if I wanted to be really uh, scientific about it, now I would do this whole process again, picking door number two, staying for 10, switching for 10. Picking door number three, staying for 10, switching for 10. Then I'd be like, well, maybe it's the first 10, you just tend to lose if you pick that one, so maybe I need to, to switch up. And so I would do like all the combinations you could possibly have. Stay switch, stay switch, stay switch. I, I would do a bunch of different combinations to really test this question. But here's what I can warn you. Statistically, this pattern will hold out, that no matter how many trials you do, how many different variations you do, which different simulators you use, you can do it with real life. You can have you know, a random, you can have somebody else randomize what the correct answer is gonna be, and then you go through this procedure, and if you stay, you will tend to lose more often. You'll actually win only about 30% of the time, about 33% of the time you'll win if you stay. And about two thirds of the time you'll win if you switch. Now there's a re really rational reason why. Let's see if I can explain it rationally and simply. So when you pick the door that you pick, you have a 33% chance of being right and a two thirds chance of being wrong. So when one is eliminated, you still have a one third chance of having picked the right one and a two thirds chance of having picked the wrong one. So you double your odds of being right if you switch. Now, if you were ever on Let's Make a Deal and given the opportunity to stay or switch, I don't know if I could switch <laughs> because if you switch, you're going to end up with, if you switch and you lose, you're going to end up with a lot of regret. Whereas if you stay and you lose, you're like, well, it was 50-50 anyway, you can rationalize it better. So. Um, I wouldn't judge you if, you if I saw you on let's make a deal and you had the opportunity to stay or switch and you chose to stay. I wouldn't judge you, but you probably would have a higher chance of being wrong because you have a 33% chance of having picked the right door on the first choice and a two-thirds chance of having picked the wrong door. So you're always going to be better off if you switch. So why did I show us this? Because it's a great example of how our common sense is not really up to the task of figuring out how the world works. We need to collect empirical data, systematic empirical data, ideally, right? where we make a prediction ahead of time and then see whether our prediction is supported or refuted by the data. So this let's make a deal little game is a good example of how we oftentimes think we know things or that we could have predicted things that we really couldn't have. Hindsight bias. Now that you know that switching is a better strategy, it it wouldn't be unlikely that you it, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to now think you always knew that that was the the way to be, right? Um, I've had students in class who have seen there's a movie that involves this um, this game. Uh, I think it might be called Game Show, but I'm not exactly sure what it's called. Um, and so they saw it explained in the movie, and they know that they're supposed to say switch, but they can't remember why. But it now, now that you know that switching is a better strategy, you're like, yeah, I know that switching is a better strategy because in hindsight now I, I think I could have predicted that. Hindsight bias explains um, a lot of people's reactions to psychological research. 
they hear the outcome of a study and they go, I could have told you that. I mean, we we paid our hard-earned tax dollars for this researcher to discover that. It's just common sense. I could have told you that. I hear it on TV all the time when people will present, you know, like on their um, the section of the news where they're talking about uh, medical findings or research findings, and then uh, they'll report something that psychologists found, and the co-host will always go, well, that just seems really obvious. Well, the reason why it seems obvious is because now that we know how the study worked out, we think we could have told you that that's how the study would work out. It was just common sense now that I know how it worked out. Back in the early 90s, there was a study where they followed kids from the 1970s to the 1990s, and they looked for differences between kids whose parents divorced when they were kids versus kids whose parents stayed together. And they found um, a higher rate of undesirable outcomes among the kids whose parents had divorced, right? Not finishing high school or becoming pregnant in high school or um, using drugs or other you know, undesirable outcomes were more likely in the group whose parents had divorced. And when they reported this on the news, people were like, I could have told you that. Well, as a child who came of age in the 80s, I'm, I can tell you that that was not the message that the news was giving us. You know, the message was that, you know, um, quality time is what matters rather than quantity of time, that um, it doesn't matter what your family structure is as long as the children feel loved. And like a bunch of different things that are probably true and probably why um, it doesn't matter for most kids but that there is just this higher rate of negative outcomes among the group of kids whose parents divorced versus among the group of kids who didn't. There's individual variations among, within those groups. But the, the common sense claim that I could have told you that this is how it would have come out flies in the face of what all the messages had been for the previous 15, 20 years. Um, no, you couldn't have told me that because that's not what you've been saying, right? Um, but now that I know the results of the, res of the research, I could have told you that, right? That's the hindsight bias. And psychology in particular really needs to be conducted in an empirical way so that it doesn't look like we are just doing hindsight bias-based research or that we are just doing biased research in general. Um, this little Family Guy clip just has a per – these two women are saying, I could have told you so. Uh, if, if, if you had told me beforehand, I would have told you. This is how it worked out, right? Because a lot of people say after the, after the um, outcome is revealed that they could have told you that that was the outcome, right? Like, this is what was going to happen. I knew it. Well, yeah, it's easy to say that now that you know how it worked out, right? Um, it, all you have to do is look back at the 2016 election and hear a bunch of people who said, I could have told you this is how it was going to work out when up until the final, you know, electoral votes came in, that is not how they thought it was going to come out. Um, but instantly people start the hindsight bias interpretation. So if we can do it so obviously in very concrete situations, you can imagine how necessary it is for psychology to use an empirical approach. That's basically the message I'd like to leave you with. Okay, now the final thing I'd like to say in chapter one is not actually part of the chapter, it is part of this class. So uh, throughout this class, I'm gonna use studies and examples um, that are good or bad examples of the scientific method that we're talking about. And um, there, it, there are no studies that are perfect, and now we're not going to talk about them because we all know that they're true or something like that. Like everything is fair game as far as scientific issues. Um, so it's really important that, to remember, remember that the reason why I bring up these examples that I'm going to bring up in class is so that we can all critically think about these studies. Um, think about the things that might be good or might be bad about these different studies. So we'll question studies. It's really important to you, for you to sort of put on your science hat whenever, we're ha whenever I'm discussing these things and trying to get you to think about these things and not your defensive hat. Like if it's a study that you believe the results of and I'm criticizing its methodology, that does not mean that I don't even think that it's true. It's, I, I may agree with the outcome of the study. I'm just criticizing the methodology. I'm criticizing the conclusions, things like that. Um, now, there are some things that will come up in this class that sound almost on the edge of I'm going to bring up something that has to do with religion. And I just want to promise you right now, I'm never going to talk about religion. Even in the section where we talk about taking things on faith, 
we're not talking about religious faith. We're talking about taking things on faith in the sense that, like, um, if Michael Gazzaniga said this about split brain patients, it must be true, right? Because I'm just taking it on faith because Michael Gazzaniga is the expert in split brain research. So, you know, if he said it, it has to be true. That would be taking it on faith, right? There, there is no reason why we should take anything he says any more seriously if it doesn't have good design and good um, evidence than we should any other evidence. Right? So that's what I'm trying to get you to do. I'm never going to say something that has anything to do with religion. I just really want you to be listening to what I'm talking about and not thinking, oh, my gosh, she's about to say something that's going to offend me or, or something like that because I'm, I'm not going to say it, so don't be ready for it. I'm not going to say it. Um, this is, those are completely separate issues that have nothing to do with what we're talking about. And we're going to be talking about things that could be studied scientifically, and then we'll talk about whether they have been studied scientifically. So you kind of get the the difference between, you know, like religion is not something we study scientifically. It's just that's not the point. And so um, we're not going to talk about that. There are some things that we're going to talk about that you might think are um, touchy subjects, like, for example, whether parents are against vaccinating their children, things like that. We're going to talk about just we're not going to talk about people being right or wrong. We're going to talk about the data and the evidence and the studies that maybe have helped to form their opinions that may have had faulty logic or faulty design, right? So those are the things we're going to be talking about. So please don't be waiting. I oftentimes have students sort of sitting on their edge of this, the edge of their seat, sort of just waiting for me to say that thing that they're going to be like, see, I knew it. I knew you were going to say that offensive thing. And I'm not going to say the offensive thing. I'm just not going to do it. So um, now I'm going to say some things that might offend you about scientific studies that you love. Um, and so I'll finish with, um, we shouldn't love scientific studies. Um, I've noticed, I'm, I'm recording this, uh, the date should be posted on the YouTube video anyway, but I'm recording this in April of 2020. And so um, it's actually April, I think it's the third. I don't know, we're on lockdown and so I've kind of lost track of what day it is. But um, so a lot of people have been sort of using their expert as evidence for what's gonna happen with this pandemic. And it's a good example of how we should never have, like, just blind faith that somebody has special knowledge. Like, you can be the greatest epidemiologist in the world, and some of the people who are dealing with this are the greatest epidemiologists in the world. The ones that are legit and good will say, we really don't know what's going to happen. Here we are. I'm sitting here in April, I think it's the 3rd, 2020, and we at this moment do not know exactly where we're going with this. Hopefully some of you will be listening to this in a future quarter and you know where it ended up. And for me to be sitting here saying, you know, we didn't know whether the, whether the epidemiologists were right or wrong. We have people who are ranging in predictions from, you know, a million Americans will die down to, you know, 20,000 will die. I mean, that's a pretty broad range and people are picking whoever, whichever epidemiologist they have more faith in to support their interpretation. For those of you who are listening to this summer, fall, sometime in the future, you know how it ended up working out. And it's kind of a good callback to remind you that when we were when we were in the middle of it, like I am right now sitting here on in April of 2020, we literally we don't know. And we can't know until it ultimately all shakes out. We can't know what's going to ultimately have happened. And so that's a really unfortunate but good example of how, you know, in hindsight, we think we could have predicted stuff that while you're in the middle of it, there literally is no way to predict. So um, we make predictions and we test to see whether the data supports it or not. That's it. So like in the case of what we're going through as I'm lecturing right now, we got to wait for the data to come in before we'll know how it worked out. So that's a great place to, to end this chapter is with that, you know, great example of science in action, right? So I will see you guys next in chapter two.